Hey guys and girls, in this video we're going to learn about electric forces. Electric forces and understanding them is the very beginning part of our journey to understanding how electricity and magnetism work and work together um, and how we can take advantage of that to make our lives easier via things like motors and radios and things like that. Um, but the story kind of has a weird beginning. Um, circa 600 BC, the Greeks, those ancient folks that were, you know, kind of smart and stuff, discovered that if you took fossilized tree sap, which you might give the name amber to that, and you rubbed it with animal fur, that it would then attract some small objects, which is kind of weird and doesn't really seem like it would be terribly useful. By the way, if you're not familiar with amber, if you've seen the movie or read the book Jurassic Park, that's where they find fossilized dinosaur, uh, excuse me, fossilized mosquitoes, which have dinosaur blood in them, and that's how they clone dinosaurs. So this fossilized tree sap stuff is actually kind of important in science. But anyway, um, the Greek word for amber is electrum, which today becomes our prefix electro. So that's kind of sort of the beginning of this whole electricity story. Um, so after careful observations made over the course of about 2,000 years, um, we learned that things that are charged in this way will sometimes attract things and sometimes repel things. And so there's two possible interactions that are possible when you have something that is charged, quote-unquote charged, um, in this way. And so what we've done is we have concluded that there are two kinds of charge, We'll kind of define what that is here in just a second. Um, and this character by the name of Benjamin Franklin gave them the names positive and negative that we still use today. Um, and so if you become an electrical engineer one day in the future, you're going to wish Benjamin Franklin had actually switched those, um, as we'll see later on. So first, let's kind of get into this idea of charge. Charge is the fundamental property, keyword there, property, of some particles, not all. Again, keyword property. Particles which possess this property of charge will exert forces on other things which have the same property, um, and we call those forces electric forces. If we're going to symbolize electric force, we would do it with a capital F subscript E. So to kind of draw an analogy, We've learned earlier that mass causes the gravitational force, like we get pulled down by the Earth's mass. Charge is what causes the electrical force. So we know that there are two kinds of charge because there are two different kinds of interactions. And if you've ever played around with magnets, which follow a very similar rule, you probably have learned the rule that opposites will attract and likes repel. So two kinds of charge which are the same kind of charge will repel each other. Two charges which are the same kind of charge, um, excuse me, two kinds of charge with the same kind of charge will repel. Two kinds of charges which are opposites will attract each other. The unit that we measure charge in is called the Coulomb, which we can give, a, give the symbol capital C for. And when we want to symbolize it in an equation, we can give it a Q. Q for charge. And we'll use both capital and lowercase q's um, kind of sort of interchangeably, depending on the situation. Okay, so the things that are actually charged. We know today, after lots and lots and lots of observations, that there are two particles within an atom which are charged. Protons that are positively charged and electrons which are negatively charged. As it turns out, both those particles have the same magnitude or size of charge. And we call that charge the elementary charge. And the elementary charge in coulombs has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So a coulomb of charge would incorporate a tremendous number of electrons or protons, something like 6.25 times 10 to the 18 um, of those. So that's a big number. Coulomb is actually a pretty big unit. So if you remember your atomic structure from chemistry, 
The protons in an atom are clustered in the nucleus, and the electrons are kind of outside the nucleus, sort of moving around. And because neutral atoms have equal numbers of protons and electrons, they are overall neutral. So this whole thing as a whole, we would say, is not charged or neutral. But this little guy right here, this electron, has a negative charge. So most things are neutral overall because atoms are neutral. The electric force is really most important on the atomic scale. In fact, it's what's actually keeping the electrons as part of the atom. So if it weren't for the electric force, those guys would just keep moving in a straight line at a constant velocity, and matter as we know it wouldn't really exist. So the important thing here is that the electric force is important on the small scale, the atomic scale, for example. So when we say that an object is charged, that means that it simply has an imbalance, meaning more of one than the other, of protons and electrons. So if I draw a simple picture, here's an object that is neutral, because it's got the same number of positive and negative charges within it. If we were to somehow add extra negative charges, then we would say that thing is negatively charged. And if we could somehow remove negative charges, we would say that it is positively charged. And so charged objects simply have an imbalance, one charge more than the other. Like a lot of things we've learned about, charge is something that is conserved. The net charge of a system, if it's closed, will remain constant. So it's not that you can't lose or gain charge. It's that the total in a system has to be constant. So you can transfer charge from one object to another or from one system to another, depending on how you look at it. Um, but charge must be conserved. So how do we actually go about transferring charges? The first, way, first thing we need to be able to um, do is differentiate between things that allow charges to move through them and things that will not. Things that allow charges to move through them are referred to as conductors. Things that do not allow charges to move through them are insulators. Good conductors are typically things like metals, like silver and copper, for example. Silver being the best, since silver is pretty expensive, typically if we want to make something a conductor, we make it out of copper. Good examples of insulators are things that are made out of rubber or plastic. So, a couple of different ways that you can transfer charge from one thing to another. The first is simply by taking two insulators and then rubbing them together. Do a little bit of chemistry there and charges will be pulled from one object to the other just to do the friction between them. And so, a good example of that is if you have a balloon and you rub it on a sweatshirt or if you scuff your shoes on carpet, especially if it's dry, or if you've ever thrown your clothes in the clothes dryer and forgot to throw in one of those little bounce sheets with it, um, you may notice that things, all those kind of things, can generate a charge. You can stick the balloon to the sweatshirt, you scuff your feet on the carpet, you can shock somebody when you touch them, and when you pull your clothes out of the dryer, they're all clinging together. You walk around, put on your new pants, and you realize there's a sock attached to them because of that static, um, because of that electric force. The second way where we can transfer charge from one thing to another is through the process of conduction. That's just the direct transfer of charge through a conductor. So for example, when you plug your cell phone in to charge it, charges are simply moving through the wires from the outlet to your cell phone, to the battery. That would just be the process of conduction. It's a lot like, we'll learn later, water moving through a pipe. The third process, and this is the one that kind of requires the most um, thought, I guess, is the process of an induction. Induction occurs when charges inside a conductor are separated when something that is already charged is brought near them. A good example is an electroscope. So an electroscope is basically just a metal ball which is attached to 
two thin metal foil leaves um, by a metal rod. And because the leaves are really, really light, we can kind of see the electric forces between them. And so an electroscope, when it's neutral, still has a bunch of positive and negative charges in it. Everything has a bunch of charge in it. Um, the thing is, is that the um, charges are balanced. So overall, we would say it's neutral. However, if we took something that's already charged, like a charged rod, and we brought it close to the electroscope, like that, positive charges within the electroscope are going to be repelled to the bottom. Negative charges within the electroscope are going to be attracted to the top. And so the way that you would actually visibly see that is now that both those leaves at the bottom, which are really light, are positively charged, and so they're going to repel each other. And so the net effect that we see is we see the leaves separate at the bottom. We can actually physically see them move farther apart as we bring this charged rod closer together. And hopefully the weather's been nice enough in class where we can actually demonstrate that and see that with our own special eyes. Last thing to kind of discuss is the idea of Coulomb's Law. So Charles Coulomb, this Frenchman, who in 1785 um, suggested that the electric force followed the same rules, as far as finding the magnitude, as gravity. Namely, that it was proportional to the inverse of the distance between the objects squared. And so what he suggested was that if you have two charged objects separated by a distance r, let's call one q1 and the other q2, that the electric force between them would be proportional to the distance between them squared and the product of the two charges. And so he wrote an equation kind of like this. 1 over the distance squared, product of the two charges on top, and then in order to get our units to be um, in newtons for force, introduce a constant. And we're going to call that constant k. K would be referred to as the charge constant, if you wanted to. And after careful measurements, we know the value of k is 9 times 10 to the ninth newtons times meter squared per coulomb squared, which is a ridiculously large number. This number right here, very big, to the ninth power, that would be like 9 with 9 zeros behind it. So in general, because that constant is very, very big, Electric forces are gargantuan. I've always liked that word, gargantuan. So rarely have a chance to use it in a sentence. But this is a good chance to use it because electric forces are, in fact, gargantuan. The thing is that we don't really notice them because most things are neutral. Last thing to do here is I'm going to enclose everything in absolute value brackets. Coulomb's law only tells us the magnitude of an electric force. It does not tell us the direction. Our rules that opposites attract and likes repel tell us the direction. So for example, suppose that we have two charges and we want to know the electric force between them. Now let's say that the two charges are the um, size of 3 coulombs and 6 coulombs and that they're 10 meters apart. So those don't really seem like big numbers and 10 meters, that's a pretty significant distance. So we wouldn't really expect the force to be very large. However, we plug in the numbers, and we actually do the arithmetic, we actually get a ridiculously large number, 1.62 times 10 to the ninth. And then if we cancel out units, coulombs cancel out and meters cancel out, that would be in newtons, so that's what we expect it to be in. That's a ridiculously large force. And the reason that that is a ridiculously large force is because these are actually ridiculously large charges. You're never going to see in nature a 3 coulomb charge because the force on other charges around it is so you know, big that you would never keep it stable. You would never keep it isolated. Okay, so here's kind of the things we need to be able to do with all this. We need to be able to explain how we know there's two kinds of charge. We need to be able to use conservation of charge in the elementary charge. We need to be able to describe and explain how charges move within conductors and insulators. 
And then we need to be able to understand and apply Coulomb's law. Figure out how big a force is, figure out how far apart two things are, etc., etc. And one last thing, real quick little reality check here. Um, you probably already know that you can't take electrons or protons and split them up into smaller pieces. And so what that means as far as electricity is concerned is that you can only have a charge that's a whole number multiple of the elementary charge, or E. So remember that's the 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 number. So for example, if you have two protons, the charge would be 3.2 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. If you have three protons, the charge would be 3 times 1.6, which would be 4.8 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So those are values of charge which are actually possible. You cannot have a value that's in between. You can't have 4 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs because that would suggest that you have a fraction of a proton. And you can't divide up a proton in anything simpler. So I just want to make sure that I snuck in that real quick reality check there. Um, so make sure we get all of our practice on this done. The big thing will be explaining things like the electroscope example. Um, and as we move forward, we're going to learn more and more about electricity. So until next time, ta-ta.